Thank you all for joining us today in this beautiful new facility. Um, I'm incredibly impressed by the food. This is my first time here too, so I'm very excited, very excited to have you all here to uh, enjoy this with us. Um, my name is Jessica Erickson. I'm President and CEO of the Longmont Economic Development Partnership. And it is my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce our keynote speaker, JJ Ahmed. JJ is the Chief Executive Officer of the Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation. He has experience in the public, private, and nonprofit se profit sectors, bringing a unique combination of expertise to his role with the Metro Denver EDC. In his career, JJ has worked in business and investment banking, including financial transactions for the University of Colorado, Colorado State University, Denver Public Schools, Denver International Airport, and several states across the U.S. Since 2011, JJ was a member of the Colorado Economic Development Commission, that's where I first had the pleasure of meeting him, where he weighed in on state and economic development, incentives, grants, and tax credits. And we always said when we were going for an incentive that if we could get it by JJ, we were in good, good shape. Um, his appointment as the chair of that commission in 2016 reinforced his ability to collaborate with everyone in every corner of the state. JJ holds a bachelor's, degree of, bachelor's of Science degree in Business Administration and Finance from the University of Colorado Boulder, a Series 7, Series 53, Series 63, Series 79, from Financial Industry Reg Regulation Authority. Please help me in welcoming JJ, I was gonna to say to the stage, but to the to this part of the floor. Get my contraption going. Thanks, you read that just the way my wife wrote it. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, my name is JJ Amanti. I'm the CEO now of the Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation. I've been in that position now for just uh, almost exactly eight months um, after my friend Tom Clark had, had uh, run the organization for some 14 years. But it is, uh, it's good to be back up here. And what are the odds that I sit at a table next to the neighbor that I grew up with, Cindy James? I knew her as Cindy Chu. So, so I grew up on a farm and a cattle ranch northeast of Sterling in Logan County. I'm a, depending on what side of the family you go on, grandma or grandpa is the fifth or sixth generation in Colorado. But grew up out and went to Caliche High School uh, with Cindy. She's just a couple years older than me. Just a couple. But a great friend and a great friend of our family. In fact, our families all get together and are getting together every year all the time. In fact, we're all getting together on December 22nd. So what are the odds I come up and get to sit next to Cindy? So it's totally cool. Um, and also get to see my friend John Frayer here from Land Title, who's a big supporter of the Metro Denver EDC uh, and, and all of our communities throughout Colorado as is Land Title. So you've got a, a great crowd here, and I'm, I'm happy to be able to come up and visit with you a little bit. I have in the, in the eight months that I've been doing this job, give this presentation where I get to talk about Colorado economics rather a lot. Um, and so when you talk about economic data and what's happening in the state of Colorado, it's really the same. It, I mean, it doesn't change speech to speech to speech. So uh, for John and others who have heard me talk about this before, I apologize because some of this is sort of the same stuff. Uh, and it reminded me of a professor I had at CU named Ruben Zubro, who's an economics professor. Anybody heard of Professor Zubro back in the day? Uh, maybe not, but yeah. So Professor Zubro, when, I think he was 142 years old when he taught my class. Um, but he was very, and this was pre-internet, pre, but he was very popular. He wrote a lot of the gaming laws in the state of Nevada um, when they legalized gaming. So he's in demand to speak all the time. And he'd give it, he finally developed this economics presentation that was really good and just took a semester off of school, grabbed a freshman TA, uh, and started traveling around university to university giving his economics lecture, almost like a rock band on tour. And, and this freshman TA would drive him from one college to the other, and he'd stand up and give the presentation, and then they'd get back in the car and they'd drive to the next college. And this went on for several months during the semester. And finally, the TA says to Professor Zuber, he's like, I've heard that stupid speech of yours so many times. I bet you I could get up at the next college and give the presentation instead of you, and nobody would know the difference. And so it was that they agreed to switch places. 
And at the next college, it was this freshman teaching assistant who stood up as the esteemed economics professor from Colorado. And he proceeded to give a 30 minute presentation that in many ways was actually better than Professor Zubrim's <laughs> up. Uh, in fact, it was so good that when he was done, uh, the audience gave him a standing ovation. Uh, but this time, can I just shut this off? This time, unlike previous times, before the uh, kid could get off the stage, somebody in the audience stood up and asked a question. <laughs> now, obviously an economics professor himself, the gentleman proceeded to ask what was a question that went on for like five minutes on the M1 money supplies and the effect of transfer payments on the GNP and just a, a myriad of other subjects this kid never even heard of, let alone been able to talk about. But without skipping a beat, the kid looked right back and says, I can't believe you'd ask me such a stupid question. <laughs> the answer is so obvious. I can't believe you'd waste my time on something as basic and simple as that kind of question. Just to show you how simple that question really is, he said as he turned to Professor Zuber, he said, I'm going to let my driver answer that question. <laughs> I don't, uh, I drove myself here, so uh, if you have questions, we're happy to take questions when we're done visiting a little bit. I'm going to direct them to John or to Cindy uh, to answer. But it is a great time to be doing business in Colorado, uh, and in our region particularly. We serve a nine-county area, so the seven counties that most people think of when they think about metropolitan Denver, plus Weld and Larimer County. So that, that service area that the Metro Denver EDC works in is about 3.6 million residents, 67% then of the state's population, and about 80% of the state's GDP. And it's a place that others want to be. Our population continues to grow, new workers, new businesses are locating here from throughout the United States and now globally, primarily California, Texas, Florida, Arizona, Illinois. Uh, and why not? It's a great place to be. Centrally located, easy to do business around the United States and around the world. Right now we're sitting about 400 miles west of the exact center of the United States, geographically. Uh, we're almost equal distance between Mexico and Canada, our two largest trading partners. Uh, strategically, we're important. We're about the only place in the world where you can hit Asia and Germany with just one bounce off a satellite in, uh, in each direction. And we have one of the world's most modern and newest airports. A $28 billion a year economic generator is Denver International Airport. It is our port, and it is incredibly important to the growth that we have had and the growth that we're expecting into the future. Virtually all of the United States is within a four hour flight uh, of Colorado, so you can get to parts of the country to do business and back within the same day. It's starting to come back up, so I'll go to me. I'll just keep going. It's, most people like it if they can't hear anyway. So it doesn't hurt my feelings. I'm used to that now. Um, and we have a, an enormously talented workforce. Uh, so the second most highly educated workforce in the United States is in Colorado. Second by degree only to the state of Massachusetts. We're home to some 30 federal research labs, which are public-private partnerships. Federal research labs are privately operated under contract with the federal government that contribute more than $2 billion to our state's economy every year. And they really keep Colorado centered as sort of the nation's math and science department. They're enormously important as we become a more innovative and entrepreneurial community. 11 public universities and private four-year colleges and universities, so over two quarter of a million enrollments just in our region alone. Community college, 300 private occupational and technical colleges and schools, including things like Galvanize and Turing, who are leading the way in sort of coding and computer programming education, nine months of really intensive training at a school like that, and then an extraordinarily high placement rate of those graduates in jobs that pay over $100,000 a year. So uh, who, who wouldn't want to live here just for the weather? 300 days of sunshine uh, every year. And even though it's a little cool today, when you're standing in the sun, it's not so bad, it's warm. So compare that to Seattle, where between October and April last year of Seattle, they had six days of sunshine. Um, 47 state and national parks from the western slope to the eastern plains, not to mention 350 breweries now in Colorado, and, and, and some famous ones from right here uh, in Longmont. Um, I might also mention, because the governor talks about it a lot, we now have more live music venues in 
uh, Colorado than they do in either Nashville or Austin, Texas. Um, so it's it's a great place to be. Um, but how do we how did we get here? And then where are we going to go from here? Because as you always have heard, like even if you're on the right track, if you just sit there, you're going to get run over. Um, so what, how did we get here? Well, we got here by working together, uh, collaboratively as a region. In the 1980s, think back, uh, nearly 50,000 Colorado workers lost their jobs in the 1980s. Um, 1982, 19,000 jobs. 1982 alone, 19,000 jobs were lost. Between 1984 and 1987, another 29,000 jobs were gone. Uh, the mid-month employment rate in March of 1987 in Colorado was 9.1%. Uh, today it's 2.3. Uh, 9.1 just as recently as 1987. In 1985, Colorado was the nation's leader in business failures. Uh, and in 1986, for the first time in a long time, more people actually left Colorado than moved to Colorado. And we're actually starting, if you've seen a report recently, we still have net in migration substantially, but the gap between people moving in and people moving out is starting to narrow for the first time in years. Uh, so there are issues that we need to be aware of post the, the, so the past is prologue, right? We need to be prepared for those futures. And Longmont was not insulated from this. The storage tech had its workforce nearly in half in the 1980s, and another Longmont disc manufacturer laid off 1,500 people in 1985. So significant impacts. Rural Colorado was impacted as well. It wasn't hard to see when people started looking that our economic outlooks and prospects were related to each other. So urban, rural, within the front range, northern Colorado, completely interrelated. The recession and stuff times didn't stop at political boundaries. Economic activity does not stop at a city limit or at a county line. So among other changes, the business leaders in Colorado and the metro Denver area, which I include to be large, um, in, in terms of its geography, even though Denver is in our name, we are not of Denver as an organization. Um, but it's sort of like as you travel the United States and certainly as you travel the world, uh, our brand, our business brand needs to be built because maybe, certainly in the United States, everybody's heard of Colorado, and certainly in the United States now, Denver, Metro Denver is the shiny thing. Um, but internationally, still, Colorado is, maybe you've heard of Colorado, and maybe you haven't. And if you have heard, it's probably because of something like Vail or Aspen. But it's not Denver. And then the distinctions within metropolitan Denver, or even these nine counties that we all, most of us anyway, call home, those are distinctions that nobody else makes. So that's why we brand under Metro Denver. And if you think back to when Federal Express uh, started their company as Federal Express and then later rebranded it as FedEx. It took out a full page uh, advertisement in the Wall Street Journal to explain why they switched the name from Federal Express to FedEx. And the most important reason was because that's what everyone calls us anyway. Uh, and so when we talk about brand management for the business brand of our region, the reason you will hear us talk about Denver, 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 is because around the United States, that's what everyone calls us anyway. They don't make the distinction between Longmont, Loveland, Erie, Frederick, Weld County, Larimer County, Denver County. Business doesn't make those distinctions. And so when we're managing the business brand and building that marketing effort, we're not doing that either. There are certainly local communities have unique attributes that make them uniquely local. And we promote all of those things when we get to that point of granularity with the company. But generally, certainly domestic and internationally, we market under the name that everybody knows us as. So I know that coming from rural Colorado, we hear Denver all the time. And certainly if you live in Long Beach, like, why is guy always talking about Denver? Because that's the market here. We're Denver to everywhere else in the world. So that's why we, we do it. Uh, but we came together and worked on what was a revolutionary, really revolutionary idea at the time, and one that has now been tried to be duplicated many places around the country with, with limited success. And that was, let's set aside those political boundaries and let's work together as a region and as communities together to promote economic opportunity. What if instead of working against each other, community versus community, we came together and worked regionally to build the infrastructure we needed, both political business and, and capital investment required to compete on the national and the global stage. So think back then, after the 80s, what came next once Metro Denver EDC kind of got started? Major League Baseball, huge, building Coors Field, 
and Denver International Airport, the two first projects that came out of the ground in the 90s, that really started to think regionally. The Metropolitan Baseball Stadium District was a regional effort. Denver International Airport was a great collaboration between Denver County and Adams County and all of the communities surrounding that. And that went back to the days of, of Tom Clark, who had this position traveling all the way through Wyoming and the region, both for Major League Baseball and to promote the construction of the airport. Huge economic uh, engines for us. And the Metro Denver EDC, the group that I work for, is a privately funded, privately <coughs> governed, regional economic development group that brings together governments and quasi-private economic developers from, um, from throughout the region to speak with that common voice to attract primary jobs to our region. And Longmont Economic Development Partnership has been a long-standing partner uh, and a critical component of what we do at Metro Denver ADC. And it's primary jobs that we work and that's important. So a primary job is defined as a job that creates more than can be consumed by its local community. And that's really important. So in other words, the jobs that we work with or try to attract to Colorado are jobs that will result in a net exporting of goods and services and a net importing to the state and our communities of wealth. Um, so we don't attract low wage jobs, we don't pursue those, and we tend to, <coughs> to not pursue retail because those are again jobs that are, have everything that's created is consumed by its local community. We work very closely with local partners who work in some of those spaces, particularly in retail, which is really important to some of our downtown areas. But in the corporate recruiting that we do around the United States and around the world, it is primary jobs. We want to import wealth and export uh, goods and services. We work together throughout the whole region, which as I said, includes nine counties. So Douglas County on the south, all the way through Weldon, Larimer County is on the north. And as the largest private sector economic development organization in the state, we really do work statewide. The reality is there's going to be nothing that's fantastically good for Grand Junction that is somehow harmful to the front range of Colorado. Um, there's going to be nothing that's great for Morgan County or Logan County that's somehow harmful to, to those of us that live here. So bridging those urban-rural divides is part of what we do, and frequently when there is an opportunity that doesn't fit in our region that would fit elsewhere, we work all the time with Colorado Springs, with Pueblo, with Mesa County uh, to make sure that we're bringing those good jobs to Colorado. Um, and with those local professionals that we work with, Jessica Erickson, Wendy Nafziger here in Longmont, we, we work stand, shoulder to shoulder, in many cases us standing on their shoulders, uh, to try to make this, this work for the whole region <coughs> and create an environment for the economy to flourish. So the private sector board that governs, and it's, a, it's a really I have two boards that I work for, the Board of Governors, uh, it's a large group. There are 220 uh, business leaders in the region that, that uh, invest and serve on our Board of Governors. So it's a lot of people pulling in the same direction. But it is a lot of people, so we have an executive committee. The executive committee is much, much more manageable. There are only 110 uh, businesses that uh, are on our executive committee. But they're active and they vote and, and they choose and they direct and they guide where we go as an organization. So it's not just sitting around listening to speeches. They are actually making decisions that affect how we pursue our strategies. And I'll talk about, I'll talk about Amazon in a minute, but, but know, for example, that it wasn't just a sure thing that Colorado would respond to Amazon's request for proposals for a second headquarters. It was the executive committee of the Metro Denver EDC, the private sector business leaders of our community that sat down, <coughs> debated it, hashed it out, and then decided and voted on it um, on whether or not we would respond. So, so there is a group of people who, who are working closely with the local professionals in your community to make these decisions. Um, and they want to boost economic activity throughout Colorado. And more, we're more concerned with winning for the state and the region than in any particular political boundary a company might choose to relocate or expand it. And, and you need to look no farther than just down the road to Smuckers to see how working together can benefit the entire region. So Weld County, Adams County, Windsor, Longmont, Brighton, all working together, cross-promoting the area to best meet the prospect company's needs, in this case workforce, rail access, low-cost utilities. Um, Metro Denver EDC working in collaboration with the state's Office of Economic Development and International Trade and then coordinating the support of existing Colorado-based companies to help land smuckers. So our big thanks to folks like Ardent Mills, who's based in Denver, but helped on this project. Loprino and their manufacturing experience that they're having in Greeley helped on the project. Fresco Foods, who's actually in Louisville, helped attract smuckers to, uh, to Longmont, Well County. So, 
this is really, really important in terms of gathering that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, recruitment that is so important in persuading C-level executives. So we leverage those companies that are experts in their industries to help tell the stories of how business can be successful in Colorado. And because of all that and the work of so many partners locally, there's a $340 million manufacturing facility that will provide over 400 new jobs to the region. So it's working and it works. Now can you imagine if each community, each city, each county attempted to compete with one another to criticize and diminish their neighbor during that process? If the ad in the local newspaper said, oh my gosh, Greeley's just terrible. Don't ever go to Greeley, come to Milliken instead. Um, or Longmont's awful. I mean, oh my gosh, you can't, can't even imagine how bad Longmont is. You should come to Denver instead. Or Larimer County, those people are crazy in Larimer County, so come to Arapahoe County instead. We don't do that here. We've never, it's not part of our culture. Um, so you'll never see in Colorado, as long as the Metro and DC is working, and our collaboration with our local communities continues to be strong, we operate under a code of ethics that reinforces our commitment and our alignment to work together. And that the biggest economic battles to be fought are for all of us working together to fight with other, other states and other regions around the United States and around the world increasingly and not with each other. So we see that other behavior though still. Most of the time, it's the other way. Around the United States, you know, we see the behavior and time after time, companies report back to us how much better our process is and the culture is than the other places that they're pursuing. And then they think, well, what would it be like if we did locate in that community and know that the community hates the neighbor right next to it and that they fight all the time? Is that the place we really want to locate our business? So the collaboration works. And after all, it is very rare, if ever, um, that we compete for companies whose employees are going to live entirely within a single jurisdiction uh, with the company. And even if they did, they'd still fly out of the same airport, they'd still shop across jurisdictional boundaries, and surely engage in commerce and business located outside the region um, and throughout the state. So seeing the same football teams, which we hope will improve. <laughs> and, uh, we, uh, same baseball team, who knew? Rockies are our playoff team, so. Um, but for us to continue that economic success, um, we have to remind ourselves that there really is only so much market share we can be able to steal from each other. And the best path for economic pr prosperity is to grow the entire pie for the state. And we work to do that nationally and globally in a really proactive way. We work and spend rather a lot of money uh, marketing the business brand of our region around the United States in a targeted effort. And then around globally, primarily where we have non-stop international connections from Denver International Airport. And by the way, there's six new international non-stops from DIA just announced in the last six months. Um, so our global connectivity continues to be really strong. We do not try to be all things to all people as a state and as a region. Uh, we work within specific industry clusters where we have a competitive advantage or a relative concentration versus our peers. So aerospace, aviation, beverage production, not just beer, by the way, but natural foods, all, you name it. And beverage production is about to expand because, and the part of this is my bias, agriculture is still Colorado's second or third largest contributor to our economy year in and year out. Um, it's four of our top ten export products are agricultural related. So as part of beverage production, we're about to expand um, a really a food science and agriculture and water coalition as well, just like we run the Colorado Space Coalition, the Colorado Energy Coalition, and we need to start working for particularly in economic development around agriculture and food science because we have some huge competitive advantage here. Uh, ten of the, of the ten most productive agricultural counties in the United States, nine of them are in California. The one that's not, Weld County. Uh, we need to take advantage of that, that relative concentration of, of industry and, ag and, and expand there as well. Bioscience, telecom, energy, financial services. We have 30,000 financial services employees now. We are the Wall Street West. Uh, like the Rocky Mountain News, you said their business section, we're the Wall Street West. There are four times more Schwab employees in Colorado now than there are in San Francisco where they're still headquartered. Um, so we, we're growing in those areas, health and wellness, and then of course IT and software. And on IT and software, I guess that's where it would fit in. Really wouldn't be an economic development presentation. We didn't talk about the small internet retailer from Seattle uh, who's announced that it's looking for a second headquarters location. Um, you probably heard of them, they've been in the papers, it's called Amazon. Um, second headquarter would bring an estimated 50,000 jobs to Colorado over the next 10, 15 years. And that last part, I think, is important. 
Uh, to put that in perspective, if Colorado is chosen for the next headquarters, Amazon would bring to the state over the next 10 to 15 years the same number of jobs our community has added in the last 11 months. So I want to be clear, because sometimes when you hear it in the reporting, this 50,000 jobs, and you think, oh my gosh, so, like on, on January 4th, 50,000 people are going to arrive at DIA with suitcases in hand, saying, all right, where do we live, where do we work, where are you putting us? Um, it's not that. Um, over the next 10 to 15 years, certainly not insignificant by any means, and a $5 billion uh, potential capital investment. Um, but it is important to keep it into perspective. And the response to Amazon, again, as I mentioned, was a collaboration between the Metro Denver and EDC and all of our regional partners and the Governor's Office of Economic Development and International Trade. It included input from all of our regional partners, including Longmont. Um, so it truly was a public-private response. We submitted a single collaborative response to Amazon that spoke with a unified voice. We did not pick one location over another. Uh, but highlighted all the areas that met or exceeded the criteria that Amazon had outlined in the RFP. Mission and mandate, again, of our organization is to locate great jobs in Colorado and in our region, but where in the region they choose is appropriately a decision for the company, not, not so much a decision for us. So no one part of Colorado received preferential treatment over another. Uh, and I also would not describe our response as being part of the feeding frenzy that has caught so much public attention around the United States about how much taxpayer money can be. I mean, New Jersey offered $7 billion uh, to locate Amazon. Um, in fact, that, those kind of tax giveaways are illegal in Colorado. So we don't do it that way, and I'm glad of that, by the way. We don't do it that way, and we never have as a state. So our proposal to Amazon is focused on our workforce, our quality of life, and our stable and predictable business climate. And just generally, it's important to know because it comes up so much, because this has focused a lot of people's attention on economic development. Um, Colorado's business incentives are modest, uh, very modest, I would say, um, and are all relative to other states, and, and are all performance-based. And this is, I think, really important. They're focused on the creation of good paying jobs, jobs that increase the average wage in the county in which they're located. Statutorily, by the way, that's defined by the legislature. If a job pays, if the average job of a company locating here is less than the, way, the average wage in the county in which it's located, it doesn't even qualify. Um, so this helps raise the bar, again, for all of us. We don't pick winners and losers in Colorado, so Amazon is not being shown anything in their RFP that isn't available to every other company that's looking to expand or relocate here, or, and this is important, to any other company that's already here that's also looking to expand and make large capital investments and are competing between doing that expansion here or doing it in another state. Um, so, uh, and the other thing to keep in mind is that unless a company who comes here and takes advantage of our incentives actually makes a contribution to the community and through a, through a tax liability, because Colorado's are all based on jobs, and then the incentive is a job growth incentive tax credit, well, for that tax credit to have any value, you have to have a tax liability. So if you're playing accounting games and moving your money to some other state, then the incentive is worthless to you. So Colorado is very, very different than the way other states do that, and that's a good thing. Um, we need to have some incentive program just to be competitive uh, among other states, but we are not in the business of buying um, businesses, picking winners or losers, or buying relocations or expansions. Now, the other thing I mentioned is whether Amazon chooses Colorado for its second headquarters or not, this process has been enormously valuable uh, to the state and the region. So I don't generally read the New York Times, but the New York Times did a huge article that funneled down all of the great places Amazon could locate and picked Colorado as number one. Um, so that kind of marketing and publicity um, among one of the states where we attract a lot of business from is just enormously valuable. Um, I've done television, I can't how many, how many television interviews about being able to talk about Colorado and the Metro Denver area and why it's so good just because of the Amazon process. As far as I think the farthest television uh, interview I did was Singapore. So globally, people are paying attention uh, to what's happening. So that's uh, the, the value of that promotional for our region just can't be underestimated. But again, may, this, is, this is also important too. Make no mistake about it. Whether Amazon chooses Colorado or not, we have a lot of work to do to keep the economic momentum and economic vitality in this state alive and well. And, th and that's the way economic development works. It's not a thermostat that you can turn up or down. 
Uh, it's not the gas pedal that you can let your foot off it. We're either in a growth economy or we're in a decline economy. There is no equilibrium. It does not exist. And certainly when you pass it, it can only be seen in retrospect. So we need to continue to build and grow. Um, and to do that, we need to be prepared to do that whether Amazon chooses us or not. Or Amazon, and one of 80 companies that are currently work, working with the Metro Denver EDC right now. It's just, so it's the one everybody hears about, um, but they're, they're, it's just one of many that we're working on. And so when we start looking to public policy issues that are really important on how do we, looking forward, address some of these things, I think the first thing I would mention is we have to, as a society, find a way to cram some space back between utopia on the one hand, whether it's liberal or conservative utopia, and the apocalypse on the other hand. Because right now, in our political discourse, there is no space between those two things. <laughs> you, you either agree with me and we live in our utopia, or it is the end of the world. Um, and that is not how life works. Business operates in the space between. Uh, and we have to change the political rhetoric in our political discourse, because right now the rhetoric leaves each side in a near permanent stage of outrage. Um, and, and there's got if you, if you ate the chicken, it's not because you hate the squash. It's just because you picked chicken <laughs> for lunch today. And we, we have to find some room for us to be able to disagree on policy issues and certainly for business to lead in those areas because business operates in that space between. But there are some pretty critical ones that I want to make mention of. Um, our unemployment rate in Colorado right now is 2.3 percent, generally. One in four Colorado citizens right now qualify for some sort of Medicaid assistance. So those two things should not simultaneously be true. The unemployment rate, 2.3 percent, and one more than one in four. I think it's 27 percent now on Medicaid assistance. We have to figure that out. So, and then and again, as a business and finance guy, either uh, wages are too low or it's too easy to qualify for Medicaid, or some of both, right? But those, that, that shouldn't exist at the same time, at the simultaneously. Uh, also, as it relates to healthcare, qu quickly, quickly, by far, and if you include federal money, by far, now the largest part of the state's budget. Rapidly expanding, growing faster than any other, state, uh, any other part of the state's budget. And we have a rapidly aging population in Colorado, so that also will exacerbate that problem. We have to address uh, our entitlement spending on, on medical and healthcare. Transportation, huge issue, huge issue. Uh, it surprises most people, although it's starting to be published a little more. Uh, you know how much general fund money the state of Colorado invests every year in transportation infrastructure? Out of the state's general fund budget? Would it surprise you if I told you it was zero? Zero is the net. And if you were gonna, and some days it's a little bit, but if you're gonna round, that the rounding is to zero. Uh, we have to make investments in our transportation infrastructure. The growth is coming whether we, and you can go back, and uh, I debate sometimes uh, third, through third parties, Governor Lamb, that you know, we didn't, the silver stake through the heart of 470, right? Well, the growth came anyway, only now the road was through neighborhoods that was way more expensive to construct and we didn't have the value of it for the term. So we have to make our investments in transportation as well. Uh, public pensions. The state of Colorado's budget including federal transfers, is just over $30 billion. The unfunded liability, unfunded actuarial accrued liability, which is a fancy way for saying debt, at our public pension system is $34 billion. So we have an unfunded debt at the public pension system that is larger than the entire state of Colorado's budget, including the federal money that we spend in any year. That is not sustainable. Uh, increasingly school districts, including St. Brain, I saw the superintendent here earlier, 20 some, 22, 24 percent apparel right off the top to, to pay the pension system. Most of that money to try to address the debt, not current benefits, the debt that has accumulated over the years. We have to address that. That is a looming financial crisis and finally even the rating agencies have started to know and, and put Colorado on negative credit watch because of the growing debt in our pension system. We have to address that issue. Uh, and then energy and water. Uh, increasingly, we're, we're energy more efficient. Colorado is growing as the capital of the world, both in terms of our, our collaboration between renewable energy and traditional energy or fossil energy. We have to protect both. We have to protect the right of our energy producers in traditional ways. And then we have to utilize the research that comes as well. So we can make that work together. We host the Colorado Energy Coalition at the Metro Denver EDC. It's the only place 
in Colorado where both the traditional and fossil folks get together with the renewable folks and sit at the same table and talk about how they can work together and, and what areas there are for collaboration. And then water infrastructure. I mean, again, having grown up in Colorado agriculture, uh, water is near and dear to my heart. So we have to continue to do things as it relates to storage. We have to figure out a way how we can build additional storage that doesn't take 25 years of permitting before we can get started. We, we need to look back at the generations that came before us. Most of what we see along this front range for sure came because of the water investments and water infrastructure investments that were made by generations before us. So we need to address those issues. So we have to do it in a way that that is respectful and collaborative, but we have to address those issues because it, it is starting to impair our ability to compete. Uh, for economic activity around the United States and certainly domestically. So um, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, we're in a great spot. Um, we're in a great position. And, and, and where else would you want to be right now than here? Um, so we have a lot of really good opportunities and a, lot, a very strong foundation to build on, but it's going to take all of us working together. Uh, the Longmont EDP, so thanks for all of your support. Uh, and for Wendy and Jessica and the team, and, and thanks for your support for all of us as we continue to try to build Colorado's economy. And I'm happy to, to wrap up there and, and answer any questions or uh, debate issues or anything that uh, suits you with your dessert. <laughs> and and thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me. It's great to, it's great to be out at Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, that was, uh, that was wonderful. It's great to have you here, and uh, as I'm Continually driving down I-25, and I feel like it's worse every day than the last. Yeah. Um, is there anyone that's championing uh, good ideas or putting out uh, a plan or thinking that uh, is starting to address that uh, front range? Yeah, I think, I mean, the Denver Metro Chamber, give credit to Kelly Broth and the coalition that she's built and is building, and the Metro Denver EDC supports that. So we work very closely in our affiliate of the Denver Metro Chamber um, as well, and have already invested more than $100,000 of our money to try to start addressing the transportation needs. It's tough in the legislature right now because the, the political divide between the House and the Senate, and add on top of that a gubernatorial election year. So the, the prospects of the state legislature addressing transportation infrastructure in the next session, pretty dim. Um, so we, again, as voters, will probably have to take the action. But we have to start making investments in transportation infrastructure. We just have to do it. Because people, people don't have a way to respond otherwise. So we become symptoms of our success. Crowded roads, schools, uh, housing prices increasing, all of those things. And the voter doesn't have a a precise way to respond when they're upset about those things. So all they have is the blunt instrument that comes in the form of a ballot initiative. And we're already starting to see the, the no growth ballot initiative, or we're going to limit growth. Well, you think housing prices are expensive now? Artificially limit the supply. I mean, just go down the road to Boulder. Boulder is now the sixth most expensive housing market in the United States. The sixth most expensive in the United States. So th that doesn't work, right? Um, it doesn't achieve the outcomes that we want, that typically want to be achieved. But that's the, that blunt instrument of a no growth ballot measure is, is what's available to a citizen when the more precise of getting into the legislature and debating on priorities and transportation funding is the better solution, but it's much harder. That's it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many, just, just so I, because I vote for, I, um, how many of you would like to see Amazon's HQ2 come to Colorado? Yeah, Colorado, yeah. yeah. Where, where they come to Colorado, honestly, is up to them. Well, just like we would never tell any company. Now, how many would say, please don't come to Colorado, choose someplace else. Thanks for the marketing, but go somewhere else. That's about what I see. Now, the other thing that I'll ask since I was here, and I've already mentioned Governor Lamb's name, I shouldn't pick on him, but uh, since people call Amazon the Olympics of economic development opportunities, uh, how many of you would like to see a Winter Olympic Games come to Colorado? How many are opposed to the Winter Olympics coming to Colorado? So that's interesting. That's interesting. In, in, tip, typically, typically, and this is unscientific, right, in my seven months, when I've asked that question, it's been the reverse of this crowd. Um, almost everybody's for Amazon, and almost and it almost flips again on the Olympics. And here, the Olympics was, was preferred even to Amazon in terms of intensity. That's interesting. Not necessarily scientific, but I was entertained and interested. <laughs> <to think. laughs>
any other questions about economic development, economic activity, what we're up to, or, or any comments of what we need to, to fix or address or not fix or stay out? So, yeah? I don't know if there was somebody else. No, I mean, go ahead. Okay. So, as you're hearing what's, what's powerful about the region, if you were to pick one thing that's, that stays most people uh, or most organizations from moving into the area, what, what would be the hot button thing? That keeps people out? Yeah. Uh, it's a combination of two things. So we spend $20 million a year as a state, not as Metro Denver ADC, but $20 million a year as a state marketing ourselves for outdoor tourism and recreation. So our brand around outdoor tourism and recreation is really, really strong, and it penetrates both professional site selectors who give advice to companies on where to move and the C-suite itself. So our brand there is so strong as being outdoor and tourism that it's starting to come back around as you guys don't work hard. Um, that, that oh, uh, and then when you add, and this is important, when you add marijuana to that, um, it comes to the mind of some C-level executives and, and even, even more acutely to private equity investors who say, oh, Colorado, all you guys do is ride mountain bikes and smoke pot. Like, I don't want you to do that. I don't want to move my company there. Um, so we have to address that issue. Now, there, there are ways to address it, but it goes to that quality of life issue, which we spend money on the one hand promoting, and on the other hand, need to figure out how to make that complementary to our business brand as well, so it's not detrimental to the business brand. Um, that Hickman Ersick, the CEO of Western Union, uh, would tell you that he likes being based in Colorado because the quality of life makes his workers so much happier that his workers are then more productive. Woodward here would tell you in Lemmer County that their facility here is more productive than similar facilities around the United States because their workers are happier. So we have to manage that, and we have to prove, and this is Vertifor, which is a private equity-backed firm that does uh, back office computing stuff for insurance companies, uh, just relocated from Colorado. Important because private equity-backed. Uh, they thought they were gonna have like 200 employees, and I think they're gonna end up with 600 or 700 by the end of the year. Uh, they're proving that you can grow, scale a company in Colorado. SendGrid, a company in Colorado, just went public. So we're, we're starting to be able to show private equity investors that no, that notion that we're casual, we don't work hard, because the private equity guy doesn't care. He didn't care whether you have the quality of life. He wants somebody sitting in a room with no windows 20 hours a day coding until he can grow the company scale and make his big exit. So we have to balance our super strong brand of outdoor recreation and tourism with our business brand as well and build the business brand and show that those things are not necessary in conflict. But marijuana and, and outdoor activities is is what we hear almost every time. And then the 2.3 uh, unemployment. So where we, you have 2.3% unemployment, so on one hand that's great, but if I move my company there, who am I gonna hire to work for me? Because everybody already has a job. All right, oh yes sir. Not to put you on the spot. Uh oh. But you get around Colorado. Yeah. What do other people have to say about Colorado? That it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I think I think you you I think that the notion of folks that are close enough to the to the city center, close enough to the airport, you have some huge advantage, but not not uh, super dense, super urban yet. So, uh, so there, there are affordability issues, there's quality of life issues, there are workforce issues that give you an advantage that you can market uh, relative to some of your peers around. There are different issues being addressed in Aurora, different issues being addressed certainly in places like Englewood, uh, different issues for Douglas County. Uh, and if you look to Colorado where the growth is gonna occur, it's likely going to keep coming north. Um, so, so I think you have some huge advantages. Um, I would be careful because I, I, I love them, but you're not bolder, um, but you're close enough. Uh, so I think you have some natural advantages, um, and that makes it a great community and a great place, a great place to be. But that again, we all I think we all rise together in that way. Uh, so certainly if you go back to the 80s, it wasn't like Longmont was cranking and Denver was terrible or Englewood was terrible and Thornton was the place to be. We, we rise and fall uh, together. All right. Well, thanks again. I uh, appreciate it. Uh,
So I do want to start absolutely by saying thank you to, to JJ for your insights on Metro Denver and economic development in the region as a whole. Um, so thank you again for that and for joining us up here in Longmont today. Uh, so typically when I'm offered a podium and a mic, I would say about 99% of the time I'm going to take that opportunity to talk about how amazing Longmont is. The other 1% like the karaoke, nobody wants that. Um, so if everybody's comfortable with kind of switching gears from the, assuming everybody in this room knows how amazing Longmont is. Yeah. Part of why you're here. Um, so I'm going to switch gears today a little bit and talk about um, Really talk about how amazing you all are. So the Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation, as JJ highlighted, provides all of the communities within the Metro Denver region a strong global voice in pursuing and winning economic development opportunities that support the economic, economic vitality of the entire region. Similarly, building a vibrant local economy to help Longmont achieve its full potential also requires a strong collective, vo collective voice. And when we talk about the fact that Longmont EDP is that voice, that is not limited to my staff, as amazing as they are, and the board of directors that I work with every day. But it also refers to everyone in this room, all of you who are supporting the work that we do through your investment, through your partnership, and through your active engagement of the work that we do every day to support economic development in our community. Longmont EDP really is all of us. It is all of you, visionary leaders that are standing at the ready to act on behalf of and invest in the prosperous economic climate of our community. When you invest in the Longmont Economic Development Partnership, you become a leader in creating the community in which you want to live, operate a business, and raise your family. The mission of the Longmont Economic Development Partnership is to lead a comprehensive and collaborative <coughs> economic development strategy to support and strengthen our community's economic health and to achieve the economic development vision for our community that has been stated in our advanced Longmont strategy adopted in 2013. That vision for our community for economic development is sitting at the intersection of high technology and manufacturing. Longmont <coughs> exemplifies the best of the front range offering a unique combination of infrastructure, <coughs> high quality of life, skilled workforce, and business friendly climate while remaining affordable and welcoming. And through our network of investors and our advanced Longmont partner organizations, we are working along community leaders, alongside community leaders like you in unprecedented ways over the last two to three years to ensure Longmont's continued success in achieving that vision. So I'm often asked why why do we call contributions to nonprofit economic development organizations like ours, like Longmont EDP, like the Metro, Metro Denver EDC, why do we refer to that as an investment? I would assume that any of you that are making investments elsewhere are doing so with an expectation of a return on that investment. If you're not expecting a return, you might want to find a new financial advisor and figure that out. But we assume that if you're investing in something that you're expecting a return on that investment. So let's talk about that a little bit. What is the return on your investment in the Longmont Economic Development Partnership? In 2017, at the end of the year, combined investment in the Longmont Economic Development Partnership, both from the public and private sectors, will equate to about $650,000. That's our annual budget. So at the end of the day, what is the return on that $650,000 investment that you have all made in the Longmont Economic Development Partnership? Well, the year, as JJ mentioned, started off with a bang with the announcement that J.M. Smucker would build a new $340 million facility here in Longmont that will ultimately bring close to 500 new well-paying jobs to our community. That didn't happen by accident. That didn't happen by happenstance. That happened as a result of the collective efforts of the Longmont Economic Development Partnership, City of Longmont, Weld County, Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation, and State of Colorado, as well as many of the other people that are sitting in this room today. That win represents literally hundreds of hours and thousands of pages of documents, proposal documents, and legal agreements done by the staff of the Longmont Economic Development Partnership, the staff of the City of Longmont Planning and Development Services, City Manager's Office, Longmont City Council, and again, a number of you that are sitting in this room today. But in addition to that, to date in 2017, 
We have actively worked with 49 different primary industry attraction retention and expansion projects. We have won 11 of those. 11 of those companies have announced either new locations or expansions here, and 33 of them are still active. Those 11 wins that we created um, as an organization represent nearly 600 new jobs to our community with an additional opportunity of another 2,000 jobs with the active pipeline that we're working with on a daily basis of projects and prospects. They represent the absorption or new construction of nearly a quarter of a million dollar, quarter of a million square feet of commercial real estate and nearly half a billion dollars in capital investment in our community. So when you think about that, think about your individual investment in the Longmont Economic Development Partnership and economic development in our community, and think about all of those things that I just mentioned in terms of return on that investment, in, ter in terms of the new customers that will be created as a result for your businesses, the new jobs that will be created for you, your friends, your family, and your neighbors, tax revenue generated for infrastructure and public services and resources within the community, increases in, in property values, the list goes on and on. In addition to our work with our primary industry attraction, retention, and expansion efforts, we've also, in 2017, deployed about $1.2 million in city-funded small business lending, grants, and program scholarships to support the attraction and expansion of 15 of our small and local businesses and partnered with the Boulder County SBDC to provide 543 hours of free small business consulting to 132 Longmont businesses. Those businesses combined in 2017, as par partly contributed to by the work of the Longmont EDP and our partner organizations, represent 500 jobs retained or created by our small, local, small and local businesses in the community. Again, think about that in terms of return on your investment in the Longmont Economic Development Partnership. In 2017, Longmont Economic Development Partnership also took on the management role for Longmont Startup Week. We had two primary goals in doing so, bringing resources from across the country directly to the backyards and the front doors of our local entrepreneurs and innovators, as well as to put a spotlight on Longmont, Longmont's entrepreneurs, Longmont startups, and the innovation activity and assets that we have here in Longmont in order to put Longmont on the map as a national hub for entrepreneurial activity. During the course of Longmont Startup Week 2017, the community hosted 74 events throughout the week to inform, educate, and connect our local entrepreneurs with resources ranging from funding and financing, product development, marketing, talent attraction, across the board. We nearly doubled registration and attendance from previous years by individuals from across the country that came to Longmont for Longmont Startup Week 2017. We reached over 80,000 people through our social media messaging and marketing and had more than 30 headlines throughout the week in local, regional and, regional and even some national online media sources, equating to approximately $20,000 in urban media for our community, for our startup community. Again, think about that in terms of what that represents for return on your investment in economic development in our community. For over 30 years, the Longmont Economic Development Partnership, AKA EDAL, AKA Longmont Area Economic Council, did I miss any? <laughs> LAEC, uh, has led the economic development vision for Longmont. We've spurred the creation of thousands of jobs and hundreds of millions of dollars in capital investment in our community. And we certainly recognize that the hard work of economic development is shared by every business owner, government leader, employee, and resident in our community, but it is the commitment of you, our investors, both public and private, that has enabled us to provide the leadership and the collective voice required to advance the Longmont economy in the ways that we've seen it advance over the last couple of years. I mixed up my page. One need only look around our community um, drive past the new state-of-the-art UC Health facility off 119, shop and dine in our re revitalized downtown and our redeveloped village at the Peaks, see the dirt moving in preparation for construction of new facilities at the Smucker's site, at Creekside, and at the site of the former Butterball facility, just to name a few, in order to recognize the return on your investment in your community. As an investor in the Longmont Economic Development Partnership, 
you are strengthening the future of our community's economic health. And for that, I want to thank you all. And I want to thank you all again for joining us today. And another special thank you to Longmont United Hospital and the St. Brain for your support of this event. I cannot wait to see what we are able to achieve as a community together in 2018. But until then, best wishes for a very Merry Christmas and a happy, happy holiday season. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.